So it's one past 10 Geneva time, if you all agree, because we have uh, many people online already waiting. I'm looking at uh, Jacqueline. As you will, I, I will now officially launch uh, this event. So we are now officially launching this event. Excellencies, dear colleagues, um, good morning to who is uh, with us here at the International Environment House, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx or now uh, watching the video of uh, this event. We have the pleasure to welcome you today for a new chemicals and waste negotiations briefing organized within the, Gen the framework of the Geneva Environment Network, which will provide an overview uh, of the work and key activities to advance the sound management of chemicals and waste uh, globally. Jacqueline Alvarez, the new chief of the United Nations Environment Programme Chemicals and Health Branch, will chair this session. Before we give her the floor, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary, as well as the video of the event, will be made available on the webpage of this event. The link is being shared by my colleagues uh, in the chat or is available on the screen. Throughout the event, um, those who are online can raise their questions by using the Q&A box. We will use your questions to feed the discussion after the presentations, if times allow. With that, Jacqueline, over to you. Good day to everyone, those of you that are present here with us and those of you that are online. It's a pleasure to be moderating this session with my colleagues. Always great to have them around. So I will be very brief in my opening remarks, particularly addressing this year as a year of change where we learned many things, but we also recognize the need of face-to-face -face activities. And though here we are not many, it's very important to, to see the faces of, of each other. 2023 is a year of promise. We have a lot of negotiations coming in and we are going to hopefully make a change in the near future. Of course, practically many of the things that we will be embracing as new will have an ending end of 2024, but we still have a lot of work to do with our colleagues of the conventions. They have already done this path in many aspects, and it is essential for them to tell us the story of how things can, can evolve in a positive manner. I will refer a little to what happened last week. 1,300 people met in, in Punta del Este in Uruguay for the intern, uh, the INC, the committee discussing plastics. It's very good to see as well how those principles that we have been embracing in this agenda are continuously being used because they are working. And I will refer to the life cycle approach, to the system thinking, the benign by design, and you will hear later today some of, of those aspects, the need of technological change, the need to address waste in a very good manner the POP's presence in the plastics, but also how to really deal with the zero waste approaches. Everybody was repeating once and again the need to do these things based on science. And we have Kevin here as well that will tell us a little more about the, the discussions on the science policy. A new treaty going to build on what we know, but also needs to have new features. So we need to be very creative and innovative to put those things forward in the right way. It, can, it needs to be feasible. It needs to be something that we all uh, can work towards. So with that, I will pass the floor to my colleague Carlos here, who will be telling a little of the next things happening in the DRS. Gracias, Jacqueline. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a pleasure for me to welcome you today to this Chemicals and Waste Negotiations Briefing. On behalf of the Secretariat of the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, I take the opportunity to thank the Geneva Environment Network for organizing today's event. In the VRA Secretariat, we have been in a, with a very intense intersessional period since our COPs in June 2022 with 14 meetings having been organized since the last chemicals and waste negotiations briefing in September 2022. And eight new plan now uh, until the COPs that we will have in May 2023. So in total in this uh, a bit less than one year, 
we are organizing 22 intersectional meetings. So you can imagine the intensity of the work in the in the third floor of this of this building. My colleague David Owen he will provide you more details on the results achieved in some of these meetings. The BRS Secretariat has also been very active, raising awareness on how the work under the three conventions to protect human health and the environment from hazardous waste and, and chemicals also contributes directly to achieve the objectives of the MEAs. For instance, the BRS Secretariat recently contributed to the high level discussions held in the UNFCCC COP27 in San Manchester. And emphasize the links between illegal traffic of waste, poor waste management, and greenhouse emissions. Also, the VRA Secretariat participated in the last plenary of the IPCC with the same objectives. For more information on the interlinkages between the chemicals and waste and climate change, I invite you to consult the joint VRS and Minamata Secretariat's publication of May 2021 uh, on how the chemicals and waste. Uh, interact and uh, interlinkage with the climate change uh, agenda and the potential for coordinated action. The VR Secretariat has also contributed to the Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee that yes, Jacqueline referred to, uh, that is negotiating the new plastics agreement and participated in the INC1 held last week in Punta del Este, Uruguay. As you are aware, through the plastic waste amendments, the Basel Convention is currently the only international treaty to legally bind countries to minimize the generation of plastic waste, the street control the transparent movements, and ensure the environmental sound management. In addition, the Stockholm Convention controls several hazardous chemicals used in plastics production that requires countries to manage waste in such chemicals in an environmental sound manner. Thanks to the support of Norway, the Secretary has undertaken a study to map the global governance landscape of plastics and associated chemicals, and to identify governance gaps and complementarities with existing multilateral instruments. The study is set to provide possible consideration for the role of a new plastic instrument in regulating plastics and associated chemicals. The draft report is available for comments by 10 of January 2023. In addition, the VRS Secretariat will also participate, uh, as, as from next week, in the COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity. The Global Biodiversity Framework that is being negotiated has 22 targets. The VRS Convention has contributed directly to achieve the target number seven, to reduce pollution from pesticides, fertilizers, and waste. For more information on the interlinkages between the chemicals and waste and biodiversity, I invite you to consult the Joint BRS and Minamata Secretariat's publication on this topic of May 2021 on the interlinkages between chemicals and waste multilateral environmental agreements and biodiversity gain sites. <coughs> Excuse me. As mandate to our, our COPs, the VRS Secretariat has also worked with the, our, and collaborated with the Minamata Convention, SICAM, and the Science Policy Panel that also uh, you will hear about during this briefing this morning. We have focused on cooperation with the entities present at this briefing, uh, either on bilateral basis or through the existing cooperation and coordination instruments between our secretariats. Under this, this task force that is coordinating the work of the, of the, of the secretariats, uh, intersecretarial working groups were established to enhance the cooperation between the VRS and the Minamata Conventions. Cooperation between the VRS Convention and the Minamata Secretariat is continuing under the renewal mandates from our 2022 COPs on relevant programmatic and technical issues, for instance, on mercury waste and on the sharing of relevant secretariat services as appropriate. We will report on this cooperation and prepare an outline of our future cooperation activities for the next biennium for consideration for the upcoming COPs in 2023. We will also participate in we participated in the online first part of the uh, open-ended working group on the new science policy panel, and we participate. We will participate in the second part of this meeting face-to-face -face in Bangkok at the end of uh, January, beginning of February. But Kevin will report about this more in detail later. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome 
The European Union draft packaging regulation that contributes to the work of the Basel Convention to prevent and minimize waste generation. If approved by the European Parliament and the European Council of Ministers, the revised European Commission packaging and packing waste regulation published on the, 20, on the 30th of November has the potential to become a game changer in addressing plastic waste from packaging through more reuse and refilling. Tighten controls of packaging, clear instructions to facilitate recycling, and minimum standards for products that aim to be bio-based, biodegradable, and compostable. And indeed, this will be a huge contribution to the to the INC on plastics. Is, uh, because as we know, packaging is mostly about plastics and sometimes paper, carton, but it uh, would be a, a, a gigantic move forward. So thank you very much for this, and I will uh, answer some questions later if there's any. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Carlos. Thank you very much, Carlos, eh, for this opening eh, words. It's impressive the work that BRS always always does. Twenty two intersessional meetings. That's um, a lot. <laughs> now I'm looking at my right, Monica, eh, for your opening remarks, please. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, and good day, uh, the, the excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and colleagues. It's my pleasure to join you today and also thank you to Geneva Environment Network for organizing what I would call end of the year briefing on uh, chemicals and waste negotiations. Both Jacqueline and Carlos mentioned many activities or negotiations ongoing currently globally, both for new platforms, instruments, but also we've been ongoing multilateral environmental agreements for sure, including also INC for plastics uh, treaty. Uh, still, I have chosen to focus on two issues in my welcoming remarks, and one of those is uh, biodiversity. So let me build what uh, Carlos has just outlined as our joint activities. In this regard, uh, as the world comes together to address the global biodiversity loss and its interlinkages with climate change and pollution, I would like to draw your attention to the very strong links between action to address biodiversity loss and actions to address uh, mercury pollution. I attended the Geneva Environment uh, Network Executive Briefing on the UN Biodiversity Conference just a couple of days ago. It focused on preparations for COP15 of CBD, COP MOP10 for the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, and MOB4 for the Nagoya Protocol on access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from its utilization. And I speak about these three instruments because I think it's important, as we have learned, that is uh, not only Convention Bio Bio Biological Diversity. And it was a very informative event, so thank you, Jen, for bringing uh, these important discussions to Geneva. However, I have to say I felt a little bit unsatisfied with the level of emphasis on pollution, taking the role uh, the pollution has in driving biodiversity loss, including marine biodiversity, and the role that has been known and recognized for decades, including in the recent IPBS reports. Mercury is extremely toxic pollutant that once released to the marine environment through anthropogenic sources puts further pressure on biodiversity and ecosystems. And in the tropical forest, uh, where mercury is used in small-scale gold mining, we have uh, multiple impacts from mercury being released to air, water and land uh, in tropical forests, including Amazon, deforestation can have a major impact on cycling of mercury and its absorption in the environment. In oceans, mercury is accumulating in marine organisms and makes some of the fish species unsuitable for consumption in any uh, larger quantities, especially by pregnant and breastfeeding people. And in the high Arctic, we know there are long data, long time data, scientific data series, and also profound indigenous uh, knowledge uh, available to clearly show the entire range of impacts mercury pollution creates. And in those environments, mercury impacts many ecosystem functions, such as the provision of food, air filtration, water purification, and also livelihoods of and health of hundreds of millions of people, including indigenous peoples who are commonly recognized as the guardians of most of the world's biodiversity. 
And recognizing, and against this background, the Conference of the Parties in March this year uh, adopted a decision that for the first time really calls for closer cooperation between the Minamata Convention CBD by requesting secretariats to come up with recommendations how the convention can contribute to the implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. A similar decision has been or was taken by BRS COP in May. And this post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which is being negotiated as we speak at the ongoing COP15 Montreal, includes target seven, Carlos mentioned it, on pollution. And what, this is the main target where uh, the work on implementation of Minamata Convention fits in. And it remains to be seen what the outcome of negotiation on this particular target will be. However, already now, based on uh, our experience so far and discussion with parties, as we have engaged to seek input how to best implement our COP decision, I can say that much work remains to be done to raise awareness about the Minamata Convention. And building this first step to raise awareness is the necessary foundation and enabler of greater integration at the national global levels when implementing Minamata Convention and the new global biodiversity framework. Making nature positive for people and planet is the way forward within the CBD to address one of the uh, triple planetary crises and Minamata Convention is one major instrument to help to achieve that. And this will be the message and commitment I will bring to the high level segment of COP in Montreal next week. The second issue I would like to um, uh, address is uh, our uh, milestones we are achieving regarding, on one hand, implementation compliance committee, so something also to uh, perhaps draw on when negotiating a um, plastics treaty, that uh, having uh, such a committee agreed from the very beginning is clearly a benefit to an um, uh, agreement or multilateral environmental agreement, and milestone in um, and that's that's on one hand, but then also to match it to have a financial instrument to support implementation of the convention. Our implementation compliance committee has recently met and will be meeting again next year and for the first time is looking at the full national report submitted by parties that provides information and a more clear picture on the discrete needs of each of the parties in implementing the convention. And it is extremely important that these needs can be met with uh, support uh, of capacity building, technical assistance, including through this uh, financial mechanism of the Convention. And this is a JAV and a specific international program. Uh, with the record replenishment of JEF 8, uh, our hope is that SIP special international program will enjoy a similarly robust replenishment at the much smaller scale but for its distinct purposes that are not fulfilled by Jeff or by the special program. Simply, we see a growing interest and the capability of developing countries to apply for funding for SIP. And I would like to invite countries to consider providing contribution to the SIP so the convention can fulfill its important uh, aims within the first decade of implementation. We had a very good governing board of the specific international program just recently. I would really hope that for their next meeting next year, I could bring a good message that we have a sufficient amount of money to launch the fourth call for project proposals. But with that, let me finish. And thank you so much. Jacqueline, over to you. Thank you very much, Monica. It's always a, a, a pleasure to hear and being reminded of the system thinking <laughs> that we tend sometimes to forget when we are working in, on our uh, areas, but also highlighting the means of implementation. Thank you for the opening remarks. Now, uh, I'm turning over to my colleague, uh, Kevin Helps, uh, sitting here. He will tell us a little where we are on the science policy panel on chemicals uh, waste and pollution prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, and good morning, afternoon, evening to all uh, here and online. Uh, as Jacqueline mentioned, I think this is the second uh, briefing that uh, I've given on the uh, process to establish the new panel. So uh, I hope uh, we're not repeating ourselves too much in this one, but there has been you know, some progress since the last briefing, uh, which I'd like to 
uh, bring to your attention and also flag uh, some uh, forthcoming events and um, areas where we would welcome your inputs and support moving forward. So uh, a little bit of uh, background just to recap on where this comes from. This comes from the Urinea Resolution 5.8 uh, to establish um, the third panel to deal with the third uh, planetary crisis uh, to be a, uh, a triplet along with uh, IPCC and IPBES. Um, and that we are now in the process of the ad hoc open-ended working group uh, which actually started its work in March of this year uh, with an aim to uh, complete the uh, OEWG process and hold uh, an intergovernmental meeting by the end of 2024. Now, th there are some conditionalities which I will be adding to that, uh, that timeline as we go through this, um, through this presentation uh, because there are some factors which... Uh, do threaten that timeline, which I think it's uh, a timely uh, reminder to to bring to your attention ahead of the resumed uh, first session, uh, as was mentioned, which will be held in Bangkok at the end of January next year. So this is a very simplistic timeline, which shows where we are. Uh, we're currently in this intersessional period 1.1 where we are now um, working on substantive documents which will be shared with uh, member states and stakeholders uh, later this month, uh, both in English and uh, translated into all UN languages. There are a series of documents which I'll, I'll touch upon shortly, uh, main meeting documents and also associated information documents which are being currently being developed. Um, the aim is to have these all available uh, with the required six month, uh, six week um, review pr period uh, for member states to uh, consolidate their their comments and questions and re and reviews in their regional groupings ahead of the meeting, which will be held in Bangkok uh, in the on the thirtieth of January to the third of February uh, next year. Um, You'll see that we have then uh, a second meeting tentatively uh, scheduled for Q4 2023 uh, and a final meeting in Q4, hopefully uh, 2024. Now, we are, however, in a little bit of a, a, um, a difficult situation with the second meeting in that the um, the proposed host country has now confirmed that they will not be able to host that second meeting. So we are currently looking for options um, from member states on where we can host that second meeting. I am pleased to say that uh, our friends from the government of Switzerland have made a very gracious offer to host the third meeting, third and final meeting, ahead of the... Um, ahead of the uh, intergovernmental meeting, which will be needed to establish the panel. Uh, you'll notice also that the uh, the dates uh, for that third meeting, there is a, a date Q4 2024 or Q1, Q2 2025. And I'll touch upon why that those dates are there uh, a little bit later. But um, there is a risk of this moving into 2025, um, and it's primarily related to access to finance and resources. So uh, that's our tentative timeline. Uh, there's a lot of work to do in between with only three meetings. We don't have the um, luxury of the, uh, of the uh, INC Plastics, which I think has had six meetings how they're going to organize six meetings in such a short time period, I don't know, but uh, we are limited to three meetings and um, we need to cover an awful lot of ground in each of those meetings and in each of the intersessional periods if we are to uh, establish this panel in the due time. So we did have a preliminary one day procedural meeting in October in Nairobi and uh, it, this was very well attended, uh, over 500 participants with 80 member sta states represented, along with secretariats from uh, the MEAs here, um, 
and also accredited IGOs, NGOs, UN entities, academia, private sector and industry. So we, there is a lot of interest uh, from across all the stakeholder groups in this process, I'm pleased to say. Um, we were able to elect seven of our 10 bureau members, um, including the appointment of a rapporteur uh, and the appointment of an interim chair. Now, this uh, is probably worth just a little bit of explanation. Uh, the one of the uh, Western Europe and other group candidates uh, was put forward as the chair of the process, uh, but this was exceptionally um, objected to by uh, one of the member states uh, present at the meeting, which uh, means that we have to uh, take that process for election of the chair through to the meeting in January. So we have allocated an additional day in that meeting to, uh, to deal with these uh, procedural issues which are carrying over from the October meeting. We were hoping to uh, appoint the chair and finalize the bureau membership in this October the 6th meeting, but unfortunately it wasn't possible. Um, assuming that uh, nomination and, and appointment of the chair goes ahead, we will then be left with uh, one region which will remain to um, finalize and formally nominate its uh, bureau membership, and that's the Eastern European group and uh, we eagerly await them to come forward with their confirmed nominations uh, for the two places which they have on the Bureau. So we're hopeful that that will be concluded in January, but we do have contingency plans put in place uh, if that isn't the case. Um, we did also adopt uh, our UNEA rules of procedure for the open-ended working group process, not for the new panel. I, I stress. So we do have a, a set of rules to which we will be operating and we have had an initial exchange of views on the establishment of the panel from many member states and from many uh, major group stakeholders. Uh, the seven bureau members are listed here. Uh, so we have uh, the two from the Latin American group, two from the Asia group, uh, Asia Pacific group, um, one from the Western European uh, and other groups, and two from Africa. Um, the member from uh, Iraq is starred, you'll notice there, uh, and that's uh, because we're now going through a process of that uh, bureau member being replaced by a representative from China. Uh, some of you will know, I think, Professor Li uh, from the Basel Regional Center uh, in Beijing. And he has been put forward as uh, the confirmed uh, Asia Pacific candidate and the candidate there from Iraq has agreed to step down. And we're in the process of exchanging the, the formal letters to uh, allow that to happen at the moment. So, why did we have an open-ended working group 1.1 and, uh, and now we're having a 1.2. Well, the 1.1 was a requirement because the actual resolution says that we will, the open-ended working group will start its work in 2022. So we have to have a meeting for that to formally be the case. Um, now, looking at what happened with the uh, open-ended working group for the plastics process uh, in Dakar in uh, in May of this year, it was decided that we could have a highly procedural, very quick one day meeting in Nairobi to, uh, in order to meet the requirement of the resolution and start the process and start the process running. Um, but that the substantive element of that first meeting would be moved to a January session. Uh, so this is the, the reason why we have this first meeting split into two sessions. So it, it is now scheduled for the 30th of January to the 3rd of February uh, in the ESCAP Center uh, in Bangkok. And you are still able to register online uh, until the 20th of December. Uh, but I'm afraid that all applications for sponsored travel are now closed. So um, if uh, you've missed that deadline, uh, I would encourage uh, member states uh, and uh, other groups to perhaps um, go to the 
regional bureau member if there is a need for uh, travel support. Uh, and on an exceptional basis, we may consider reopening it. But after this meeting, I do actually have a meeting with our governance affairs office in Nairobi, where we will be finalizing to a large degree the list of uh, sponsored um, travel that we will actually be supporting for that meeting. So uh, I'm afraid uh, it would be very difficult for us to reopen that. If you have any uh, practical um, questions, uh, there is a meeting page which you can access. And um, I think this presentation will be shared uh, and the links should be live. Our agenda, um, these things are fairly, fairly standard, but there are um, some key points to, to look at here. Uh, at that first meeting in October, we were requested by member states to focus this second meeting primar primarily on issues related to the scope and the functions of the new panel. So um, we were intending initially to also open the discussion on rules of procedure and governance of the new panel, but we are now just focusing on these issues of scope uh, and functions. So. Um, the majority of the work and the contract groups will be uh, to be established will be focusing on those two areas along with the budget and work plan for the open ended working group process so that is the focus of this uh, meeting um, and we are hoping that we will make significant progress in the area of functions uh, particularly where the resolution is very um very well, uh, the, the, the functions are very well defined in the resolution. So we have provided um, option an options paper, which will be uh, shared very soon on what those particular functions will, would actually look like. And similarly, we've uh, developed a, a document on examining the, the potential scope and the options which we face uh, and the decisions which need to be made by the member states uh, moving forward. Uh, on uh, defining this. Now, the, the, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation here because we are really dependent on having a clear set of functions and a clear scope in order to define the stakeholders with whom we need to interact. Uh, but at the same time, we need a broad group of stakeholders to have input into those discussions uh, along with member states to ha actually table proposals and suggestions as to the functions and scope of the work that we need to look at. So uh, we are hoping to have a, an inclusive process which uh, allows academia, industry in its broadest sense, civil society, NGO groups, um, all to um, have uh, an opinion uh, and be able to um, come up with ideas and suggestions as to what this new panel should look like or could look like um, and what the implications of the var variety of scopes and functions would mean in terms of operate operationalization uh, and also the the uh, inform the um, governance structure which we need to have in place in order to make that happen. So it, it's very intertwined. Um, it's it's going to be a complicated discussion, I'm sure, the scope uh, particularly. And uh, we hope that we've provided enough background uh, in the documents to stimulate a very uh, healthy and uh, fertile discussion there. So this just very quickly you know, summarizes that, that you know, we will be looking primarily at options for scope and options for principal functions. Um, we do need to look at the issue of timetable budget and sequencing uh, of the open-ended working group. And here, um, you know, there is a stark realization which needs to be, uh, you need to be made aware of in that after this uh, meeting uh, which terminates on the 3rd of february basically all of the um, funds for the uh, operation of the open-ended working group will be exhausted so we will be in a situation unless uh, funds do come online uh, very soon that we will have to pause the work 
Now, this is the issue which concerns the the shift or the possible um, delay in the second and third meetings uh, and the potential for this process to actually extend into 2025 because without operating finance and, and, and capital and, and any sort of financial liquidity, even though we have a, a very small secretariat staff who can do some work, um, it means that we can't start planning for meetings unless we have funding in place. So it, it's a very um, unfortunate situation. Um, it's a reality of uh, a lot of a lot of competing priorities and a lot of sort of global issues which are going on at the moment. Uh, and we are hopeful now with uh, some recent discussions with a, a couple of um, very uh, very potentially large donors that they'll come forward and support us. But there is a risk that uh, if there are delays in funding coming forward, we will have to press the pause button on this process. So this is the uh, list of meeting documents which are being prepared. Um, as I say, these are all currently in for translation into the six UN languages. And we are hoping that we'll be able to make an advanced English version available uh, in the uh, in the coming week with the translated versions being available six weeks before the date of the meeting. Now, it's a little bit unfortunate that there's Christmas uh, in that period, but I'm sure you all enjoy a good read over the Christmas period. So um, perhaps you can you know, save on um, Christmas presents and, and give these documents out to your families and, and get their views and comments on them. Just, you know, just an idea there. Um, we also have a series of information documents which we're currently finalizing. And one of the, one of the major um, efforts which is going in at the moment where we have a, a team of, I think, four people currently working on this is the mapping analysis of the current landscape. It's a very, very cluttered, complex, interrelated um, landscape in terms of different bodies and different stakeholders who are highly active in this area. We have BRS and Minamata and Psychem in the room, um, just to name three. And defining the interrelationship between the, any new panel and the existing bodies and the existing MEAs needs to be done. And it, then obviously there are implications in terms of getting their their governing bodies to come back and say, yes, we agree with this type of interaction. We're also looking at uh, what we can learn for future meetings by a comparative analysis from existing assessment structures and stakeholding, uh, and also, sorry, uh, inventory of rules of procedures uh, in preparation for the second and third meeting. So just, just to lay the, the foundation and the seeds for those future discussions in those key areas. We're also going to uh, give an analysis of the uh, existing work which has been done on stakeholder engagement through surveys and webinars, and we'll be showing sort of some trend analysis and some key points from that. Uh, we're also proposing then a series uh, at the meeting in Bangkok, a series of, should we say, what we're calling deep dive dialogues uh, with a, a small panel of experts uh, looking at key aspects of scope and functions as defined in the meeting documents and also as in the um, uh, in the original resolution. This is really to open this discussion and have inclusive dialogues across stakeholder groups. Uh, we previously called this a stakeholder forum, but we, we think that these these sorts, this sort of description actually is a truer reflection of what we actually want to achieve. We want to get views, uh, views from across stakeholder groups as to where this could land, where we should, what our ambition should be. Um, the budget status, uh, I've actually just touched upon. Uh, these are the member states. And again, uh, France, Germany, Norway, Switzerland, the UK, Thank you so much for your contributions. Something which isn't up on here is the you know, contribution from the 2022-2023 uh, uh, UNEP Environment Fund of $275,000. So it shows that we are you know, serious about supporting this. And also currently we are covering most of the costs of the Secretariat. So um, you know, this is an extra budgetary process and we do need to find uh, a way of covering that in future. 
Um, last two slides. Now we have um, already reached out to WHO and IMC member organizations as stipulated in the resolution. We are in continuous dialogue with relevant MEAs and other panels and um, continuing our efforts to reach out with CSO, IGOs, academia and private sector. So we really want to seize this initiative after the uh, the second uh, the 1.2 meeting uh, and continue these efforts to engage, but without uh, adequate resources, we'll not be in a position to do so. Uh, we did conduct a stakeholder engagement survey, 386 responses so far. Um, we will be pro providing an analysis of this uh, document as in six at the meeting. Uh, we also have a series of webinars where we are planning to continue on the two that we've held so far, uh, one in the week of 16th of January, to again look at scope and functions and perhaps provide some more information after the uh, issuance of the uh, papers, meeting documents, uh, and get some feedback from member states. Uh, finally, the national focal points issue. We are still missing a lot of national focal points. We only have 109 registered. We have um, very few from the Latin America uh, region uh, and Caribbean region. And so we do. Uh, we are urging our bureau members to assist us uh, to fill those gaps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. And it seems that Santa is coming to town, right? <laughs> I hope not only with documents, but also with some maybe coins <laughs> or bills. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much for, for the presentation. I think we will let uh, the questions uh, for afterwards. Now I'm looking at my colleague Rafael to guide us through what's happening on the SICAM uh, process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And it's it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for invitation to Jen. I'm here on behalf of the SICOM coordinator, Nalini Sharma, who unfortunately could not be here. And as I, it's the first time I think I'm, I'm uh, here and speaking to you. So I would like to say that my name is Rafa Brikowski and I work in the SICOM as secretary as a program management officer. My presentation today will be focused on on, uh, on one event that actually is, is uh, has been in the finally scheduled into two um, dates because we have, uh, I would like to speak of, with you about the updates regarding the strategic approach and sound management of chemicals and waste beyond 2020 uh, intersessional process. And uh, I will m speak about the upcoming event, but actually to to give you a full picture and to actually provide you with, uh, with the understanding why we are meeting in the resume session in Kenya I need to a little bit uh, go back and tell you some few words about the outcomes and uh, and of the suspended IP4 meeting in Bucharest. It's uh, it's an obvious thing that uh, to start with saying that the, the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, has affected all of us, but I think that it was. Uh, particularly relevant for the, the, the intersessional process, which has been halted for basically for a, quite a while. And it was it was a, a real pleasure to see uh, so many people arriving to Bucharest to meet in person uh, at the end of August and to have a very fruitful discussions on how to uh, come back to the to the work and to, to going into the final stages of the negotiation of the future uh, uh, beyond 2020 instrument. So we had around 300 participants coming from governments, from, from academia, from industry, from the civil society and other groups of stakeholders in Bucharest. The work that has uh, taken place in Bucharest focused basically on trying to get our uh, future structure and, and, and uh, oops, our future structure of the instrument. I think I, uh, the presentation has been lost for a moment. I will continue talking. So basically, the, the focus was to try to get to our uh, structure of the instrument and uh, a document, a single consolidated document that would reflect all of the uh, proposed approaches and elements of the future framework into one place. And to support that, there, there were three thematic groups that have been established in Bucharest. And the first one was uh, with a mandate to work on a vision, scope, principle, approaches, and strategic objectives. 
with a particular goal to have a proposed limited set of priority targets into support of the strategic objectives. If, uh, if you follow the, the discussions, you may know that we had around uh, more than 100, if I remember correctly, around 140 targets proposed. So it was, it was great to say that at the end of the, of the discussions in Bucharest, we have uh, made a huge progress with identifying 28 high priority targets. And also there was a, a, a very good discussion about how to fine tune the wording of, of the five strategic objectives and progress was achieved there. Finally, we have also had three new options proposed for the vision of the future instrument, and it, this would be a basis for the for the future work. The time hasn't allowed to to work in detail on several of elements, including uh, detailed text of the targets and also on indicators. So this is one of the things that actually will follow in the meeting in in Nairobi. The second thematic group focus, work was focused on institutional arrangements. And uh, that will include also the work in relation to issue of concern. As you know, there is uh, under SICAN, we have uh, we have several issues of concerns and emerging policy issues that are a very important part of the SICAN work. But also, as as, as Kevin was uh, mentioning, there was also uh, discussed uh, linkages with the Future Science Policy Panel, which is uh, I think it uh, building on his words is is difficult from perspective of the Science Policy Panel to to uh, to see how everything works, how to link everything. But I would say that actually from uh, from the perspective of building a new instrument is also a, a, an additional level of, of complexity and challenges. So. I wanted to say that discussions were taking place in Bucharest and there is a, a consensus that there is a need to link, have linkages, but there are discussions still to follow on how to actually do it in practice. Moreover, the group has discussed also the mechanisms to support implementation and a lot of progress was done in relation to institutional arrangements that some, such as the Bureau or the governing body of the future framework and instrument. Finally, the third group, it worked on the final was focused on means uh, to support uh, to support uh, implementing measures also to support capacity building and, and discuss financial considerations there are um, um, there have been a significant progress in trying to remove brackets from the text that has been discussed but also we need to note that actually there are many additional proposals for uh, the text included in the discussions in Bucharest for instance from Africa group on the global coordinated fee or for ICCA on a capacity building platform, Iran, Switzerland, and ITOC had also provided some uh, input to the discussions. This leads me to the final slide on uh, the previous IP4, suspended one, that uh, to mention that in the end, the coaches were happy to present a consolidated text in the plenary on the final date of the meeting, which uh, highlighted the uh, vast amount of work that has been done, but also it also was uh, seen that actually there is a need to continue working on, on many elements. Therefore, the meeting has decided to suspend IP4 and resume in, in, in early 2023. And I will just move very quickly to the next uh, information about the agreed timing and the new meeting. But just wanted to mention that also at the same day, it was finally announced uh, the, the dates of the ICCM5, which the ICCM5 president announced, and it will take place in between 25th and 29th September 2023 in Bonn, in Germany. Another thing that I wanted just to mention, and you may remember the slides also from the last briefing, that uh, a very important uh, discussions were also taking place during IP41 in Bucharest about uh, strengthening integrated approach to chemicals and waste management. And there was a proposal coming from IOMC organizations that included three the key dimensions uh, of such strengthening. One would be a, um, a development of basic chemical management systems and capacities in all the countries. And the, the second dimension is to have uh, implemented integrated approaches in key industry sectors and product value chains, which is something of, of great in, in importance and relevance. And also uh, how to uh, and strengthen an, an integration of uh, of the work on chemicals and waste management with broader economic, social, and sustainable development objectives. These discussions will continue. I think that my uh, my colleague uh, Sandra will have some further information about you how this work is also taking place in the intersessional area. At the time, so I will not uh, move much. Uh, concentrate on that, and I would just uh, like to mention that as it was announced in Bucharest. There have been discussions and there have been a silent procedure uh, and the, taking place in, in, uh, with all the SICOM stakeholders in October. 
that uh, allow us to, to confirm that the resume meeting will take place between the 27th of February and 3rd of March 2023 in Nairobi, Kenya. We plan to have uh, two days of preceding meetings. Saturday on the 5th, 25th February will be focused on, on technical briefings and on Sunday we expect to have regional stakeholder and sectoral meetings. Uh, the invitations to this resume meeting, as well as provisional agenda, which is, by the way, the same that for the for the for the suspended meeting, has been circulated to second stakeholders uh, on 11 November. We have already provided the first version of practical information for meeting participants, and and if of you are interested in in details regarding visa, hotels, or any other things uh, that uh, might be of importance for the practical preparations for going to the meeting, you are welcome to have a look on the document, which is uh, the direct link is introduced in the slides. But also there is a, a meeting website that, that uh, you will see in a second that have more than this also additional information regarding the meeting documents, working and information documents. We also uh, require and ask uh, participants to register. There is a link directly in the slides in, in case you would uh, like to uh, forward it or to share it with your, with your constituencies. Uh, we would like to just to, uh, remind that uh, the deadline for uh, for uh, non-funded delegates is is still in January. However, we have uh, I just would like to mention that initially we had a deadline for uh, delegates uh, requesting funding to be the seventh of December. However, we have uh, yesterday circulated uh, uh, information that we we would like to ex ex extend the deadline a little bit more. So now the deadline is 14 of December. I encourage all of you to to circulate that information if it hasn't yet been received by uh, SICAM Secretariat Communication. And uh, we would like to also say that we had 300 uh, people in Bucharest, but we had uh, made efforts uh, for with our uh, of all our stakeholders to increase the participation for this important IP4 tourism meeting. So we should be happy uh, to be able to provide some additional support for, for members from from uh, from many regions. Ah, that's why I just I, I, I will finish shortly. So just to let you know that that we, we would like to and we'll involve uh, the bureau members and the regional representatives from from uh, all the regions and all the stakeholder groups to, to pro support us in selecting the funded participants. And also to just to support uh, coordination among second stakeholders from coming from the governmental authorities and bodies from the same country. This time we, we also asked you to, to uh, during the registration process to provide some uh, letter from the second focal point uh, about uh, supporting the nominations. As mentioned, this is a resume meeting, so all the documents that uh, have been used for IP4 are already available, and you can you can have a look on on the the fourth intersessional meeting webpage. And we'll be also providing more information uh, specific for IP4 to as soon as as available. And uh, some of the documents, uh, like like annotated agenda or a scenario note, we are still uh, we are updating it, so it will be available within this the, the usual six week deadline by the 15th of January. If there is any request from from the stakeholders to provide uh, additional information document, we encourage you to do contact us as soon as possible, and uh, in advance of that of that uh, of that uh, deadline. So early January would be the very 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 latest time when you could contact us on this. Finally, just to, to final slides, we'd like to mention some of the other initiatives that are taking place in, uh, in the meantime. So the coaches of the IP process have uh, launched a consultation process to, to provide some high level reflections and also to discuss with the stakeholders some, uh, some issues relevant for IP42. And uh, this process was started early November. And uh, last week on Friday, we have uh, finalized, there was a deadline for providing comments from, uh, from uh, the constituencies. And all of the comments received have been already posted on the on the web page, which is you can find the link below. So if any of you are interested on what stakeholders from various regions and stakeholder groups have uh, provided in response to that request from the IP coaches, you are happy to 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 uh, digest and to have a look on them. We the, the IP coaches will have the update on the consultation process during the meeting of the bureau ICC and Five Bureau, which is taking place next week, and then some further steps will be announced later on that. And just uh, the final slide, I would like to, to mention that we the regional briefings will be on online briefings will be organized with all the regions following the publication of all the documents in mid in mid uh, January. 
and they will take end of in the, in the week of 25th and 23rd of January for Africa, Asia Pacific Sea and for Grulak region. And we expect to have the, the, the one for Western Europe and other region in early February, the date is still to be confirmed. With that, I would like to thank you and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, maybe very quickly, IP for the resume session will be only face to face. You will have live stream, uh, but uh, no online participation, correct? Yes, that's correct. We have the same setting as we had for the, the setting in, in Bucharest. So this is a face to face meeting uh, with uh, streaming. Yes, thank you. And Kevin as well, for you, for the science policy, it will only be face to face. So now I'm turning to my left. <laughs> so David, uh, your turn. Uh, thanks, uh, Jacqueline, and uh, thank you all. Uh, and I can see how busy it is for everyone, and certainly for BRS, it's it is uh, very busy trying to catch up from from COVID. Uh, all the backlog of work there, and then only having 11 months between our face-to-face -face segment of our COPS and then our, our uh, uh, face-to-face -face COP in, uh, in May of next year. And to sort of expect your question, yes, that will only be a face-to-face -face meeting as well. So, that, that's, uh, so that's known. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is just move quickly through the um, the intercessional work that's ongoing. We're about halfway through the intercessional work, which Carlos mentioned all the meetings that are that are ongoing. And so what we're really looking at is part of our sprint is making sure that we get all our subsidiary bodies completed. I won't even mention all the, the intercessional working groups, but to start with these, uh, there was a um, there's a subsidiary body of the Basel Convention on Implementation on Compliance, which assists parties to comply with their obligations under the convention and facilitates, promotes, monitors, and aims to secure implementation and compliance. So this is a very important group. They've considered several uh, individual cases. Uh, they've reviewed the classifications and the national reporting process in general. Um, they've developed a program of work. And they even held a joint session with the newly developed Rotterdam Compliance Committee, which I'll mention earlier. But this is a group that always gets a, a lot of work done and helps countries to uh, to get get into compliance with the uh, with the Basel Convention. Also mentioned that there was a, a plastic waste partnership meeting that took place. I guess it's a couple of weeks ago now in Punta del Este, uh, just before the. Uh, before the uh, INC on plastics, and this partnership is to mobilize business, government, academic. Uh, oh, sorry, moving too fast. So this partnership is to uh, mobilize business, government, academic, and civil society to promote and improve uh, ESM of plastic waste at all levels and prevent and minimize its generation. So they had the third meeting, as I mentioned, and so they approved a report on best practices and lessons learned. They approved a compilation of national and international specifications related to Basel Convention plastic waste amendments. And uh, for, the, for its future work plan, the working group discussed development of products to disseminate best practices and promote, pr promote policy development in various topics of relevance. To this discussion. And then what's coming up now is uh, the open ended working group of the Basel Convention, uh, and it assists the COP in keeping up with the continuous review of implementation of its the various mandates that it provides, in particular to these intercessional working groups. Uh, it's just a three day meeting this time. Uh, and uh, so we will have to work very quickly to to consider recommendations to improve the strategic framework. Develop recommendations on including on improving the function of the Basel pick procedure and consider various technical guidelines, including those on pops, plastics, waste, uh, and waste lead added lead acid batteries. 
and it will consider other guidelines and technical um, fact sheets, and it will continue to progress work on legal clarity. And as I mentioned, there are, there's a, a number of, for all those, there are sort of intersessional processes related in particular in the areas of legal clarity, technical guidelines, but I won't go into all those now. So now move to Rotterdam Convention and upload, update there. So the the, the RC uh, subsidiary body on is on the uh, the first one is on the Chemical Review Committee, and it had its its uh, 18th meeting in September in Rome, and it finalized decision guidance documents on two chemicals, and these chemicals then can be considered for listing at the COPS in in 2023 and it reviewed uh, uh, notices of, of, of final regulatory action for a, a wide range and especially there's quite a few chemicals on the agenda and if those chemicals where those chemicals where they're seen to meet the criteria then they move to the next stage which is developing the decision guidance document and uh, so this this happened for methylparathion and paraquat so those will not be on the agenda for this COP, but the future one, because they'll still have to develop decision guidance documents for that. And then, as, as I mentioned, we there was a newly established uh, Rotterdam Compliance Committee, uh, and that group held its first meeting uh, just uh, in November, uh, back in the just across the street here, and they agreed on modalities for its work and decisions and recommendations. And uh, it um, they dealt with many general issues related to compliance and uh, laws, regulations, exports, imports, information exchange, information submission, and cooperation with the Basel Convention, ICC. And they looked at the program of work and budget and as mentioned before, they even had a joint session with the Basel ICC. So that was a sort of a historic event, and it was the very first a long-awaited uh, uh, establishment of that, that committee. I'll just mention one other uh, development that is quite significant, and this is a proposal by uh, Switzerland, Australia, Burkina Faso, and recently added were um, Ghana and Mali, I'm sorry, and Mali. So that these were the, uh, this is a proposal to mend the, uh, the, the uh, Rotterdam Convention and, and including adding a new Annex A to the, con to the convention. Uh, the, I won't try to describe it here since one of the proponents are, is, is, uh, is in the room, but the idea is to establish a new Annex in addition to Annex 3 for listing chemicals that have been found by the, the Chemicals Review Committee to meet the criteria for listing in Annex 3, but for which the COP was not able to agree to list. They weren't able to reach consensus that's required for listing in Annex 3. But uh, it does establish rights and obligations for parties to the amended convention in relation to chemicals listed in a new Annex, Annex 8. And for those uh, parties that have agreed to be bound, uh, by this, then the PIC procedure uh, would be would apply to to those chemicals, and so this amendment was um, was circulated at the end of October, six months before the COPS as required by the by the convention. There are other developments, and we'll go go through those uh, perhaps at a, a further in a uh, in a future uh, briefing. Okay. And then we go to Stockholm Convention, and I'll just cover the one at this particular meeting, but this is on the uh, the POPs Review Committee, which also met in uh, September in Rome. These The POPs Review Committee and the CRC meet back to back, and they recommended to the COP that it consider two new chemicals uh, for listing, and that's Declarin Plus, which is a flame retardant and used in other purposes, and then uh, UV328, which is a, uh, it's a ultraviolet rate, uh, ultraviolet radiation absorber in a wide range of products, including plastics. So there is a link to the work on plastics there. And then they've adopted uh, risk profiles uh, for a number, for a couple of other chemicals. But those chemicals will 
whereas the first two chemicals will be considered at the meeting of the COP in 2023. The other two will not be ready until the 2025 COP if they continue on in the approval process in the uh, in the pop rock. So moving right along. So the the COPs will be held from one to uh, to 12 May 2023 here in Geneva at the Geneva International Conference Center. There will be uh, on the 30th of April, there'll be regional meetings and there'll, there'll be no high level segment. And as mentioned before, there this will be a face to face meeting without the possibility of online participation. And then just to road ahead, uh, we've already had three individual bureaus meetings, one for each cop. And those took place in October. And then next month we have a joint bureau meeting from the 18th to the 19th of January. And at that meeting, there will actually be the tentative schedule of work for the cops. And uh, I don't know if you've seen these before, but they're actually very complicated because we switch from one convention. Well, there's joint sessions. We switch from one convention to another and try to space out the work to get as much as possible done uh, during, during the two week period. So that will be available soon after that meeting. And then on the on the road ahead, as I mentioned, as uh, as it's laid out here in November, the invitation letters were sent out. In December, there was a notification to observers, and the finalization of the theme of the COP will take place uh, this month. And then the the deadline for party registration is the 25th of January, and that's of course. Uh, very important for those that are seeking financial assistance to participate in the meeting. The, bu the budget documents and a few other documents will be available on the by the 1st of February. They have to be out three months before the meetings. And then all the other documents will be out by the 1st of March, which is two months uh, uh, before the meetings. Uh, in March, we also have these uh, regional preparatory meetings with all, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, and then there'll be a series of webinars in, in April. And then here's quickly the schedule for the uh, regional prep meetings, Asia Pacific uh, in March. What does that mean? Two minutes. <laughs> I'm watching here. Uh, I, I, we've got uh, Asia Pacific is in Bangkok, uh, the Africa in March, and then the Africa one is in Dakar. Eastern Europe is in Zagreb, uh, the last uh, three days are well, the 28th to the 30th of March, and then also in Panama City from the 28th to 30th of March for the Grulac region. So those are confirmed. This is just the meetings that are coming up. I won't go through these at this point, uh, just to mention that um, that we are going to be doing some chairs training again, which is a very popular program, and it will include SICAM. Representatives from SICAM, Minamata, Plastic INC. So it's uh, it's a, a, a very valuable training that I think that really helped to prepare to become chairs of subsidiary bodies and and even cops eventually. So last thing is that there will be a, a what we have at every cop is sort of a fair on the side of the cop, and the first is and this is going to be on PCBs this year. It's important because of the deadlines in the Stockholm Convention to eliminate use by 2025 and then disposal, complete disposal by 2028. So it's quite timely. And the idea is to raise awareness and accelerate uh, action uh, to meet these deadlines. And so this this will take place the 3rd to the 5th during the, the COPS. More, more information will be available soon. Thank you. <laughs> That was the fastest two minutes ever. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> yes, and congratulations for the compliance committee set up. Yeah. Finally, <laughs> that's a, a great success. Uh, turning into our other MEA, Minamata, Claudia, please. Sure. 
Thank you very much, um, Jacqueline. It's so nice to see you in this particular capacity. It's so lovely to have you in this way in the chemical and waste cluster. Um, my name is Claudia Tenhafe, and uh, I would like to build on and under the chapeau that was so well presented by Executive Secretary Monika Stankiewicz on some of the specific work of the Minamata Convention. And also just to say, uh, Carlos generously also already indicated some of the joint work. So I will not be uh, repeating any of that in the interest of time. Mindful of the time, I have 12 slides, nine issues and 10 minutes, and I shall seek to, to, to do justice to that. But please know that um, our slides are available afterwards and there may be more detail on it. And you are always welcome to reach out to any of us or to stop by for a coffee and we shall be happy to give you more information. With that, let me go on to the first of these slides, um, which gives a snapshot of uh, the work that we are not only doing now, but just to contextualize it in terms of our journey, the Minamata journey now in preparation of the fifth COP, which is upcoming. It is in the fourth quarter of next year, so we will be after the Mina, after the BRS COPs. Um, our usual cycle has been uh, restored after uh, the, 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 the unusualness, of course, of that the pandemic has brought with it. But I will go into some of the details uh, of the last bit of that slide in terms of the key topics uh, that we have under preparation with you as parties, and I see many in the room, thank you for coming, and also online. Uh, in terms of the work and uh, with regard to updates since our last briefing. Let me take you to maybe one of our keystone topics and uh, that we are very, uh, of course, very happy about the enthusiasm of our parties on uh, the preparations for the first effectiveness evaluation um, of, the, of the Minamata Convention. This is a very specific and special part of the convention to ensure, of course, over the long term that the Minamata Convention delivers on what it set out to do. Um, the first effectiveness evaluation was launched at COP4, and so there's work underway. And I'd like in the next three slides just to draw your attention to three parts of that work. Here, and it might be too small for you to see, but please just visit our intersessional page to get all the information. Um, we've recently had a Minamata online event in November, middle of November, about the call for parties and others to make further comments to the refined list of indicators uh, that will be put forward for adoption at COP4. Um, and here you see projected the comment sheet, you see the original text of the, of the indicator, you see um, some of the refinement after the very valuable comments that were received during the intersessional period building up to COP4 and also so uh, uh, the discussions at COP4, um, so uh, just for you to be perfectly oriented both in the work that's already been done, but also what still remains to be completed uh, ahead of COP5. Um, the deadline for those comments is the 31st of January. We hope, of course, that this deadline works for parties and stakeholders. It's very important to, to know that this refined list uh, is more matching to, to the hopes and if and where something is still missing that we know so earliest to be able to uh, support parties in this regard. Let me take you to the next part and just to say here the open-ended scientific group has been very busy. They have already met five times in this intersessional period. This is one of the bodies established under the effectiveness evaluation. The second body that uh, uh, has not yet, uh, the terms of reference have not yet been completed in terms of the number of representatives is the actual group overseeing this work. So that is a very important part to bring to COP5, in other words, to uh, agree on the number of representatives per region to the effectiveness evaluation group, a type of committee to oversee the entire process. But in anticipation of that, the science group has been extremely busy. There are 40 something uh, members on this group currently. It is open ended. So any party that has not yet been in a position to nominate, um, we are most welcome to still do so. And all of the materials and the work that's already been uh, ongoing is available through the intersessional workspace. Um, uh, links available. Um, and to say we are also planning, we, while most of the work this year has still been online, our intersessional work is also moving into face-to-face uh, -face meetings next year as the work comes together and maybe the more detailed negotiations or completions do require that physical presence. And so this group will be meeting at the end of March next year and we very much look forward to this very dynamic part of the effectiveness evaluation work. 
let me also take you to just an update on two reports that are that are also that have been commissioned by the COP and that are underway of preparation. On the one hand, the Mercury Trade, Supply and Demand report, and on the other hand, the Article 21 Synthesis report. I won't go into detail. The detail is here, but should you have any question, uh, please just uh, let us know. This takes me to the next point, which is on gender. We have a very ambitious, um, we had a very, very uh, supportive uh, um, decision at COP4 on the work of gender. And Monica mentioned, of course, also the special vulnerabilities that come uh, with mercury, but actually, in fact, with all of our chemicals. So uh, we share this across our, our, our family of MEAs. Um, the work here has also been going rapidly. We've had stakeholder converse, uh, consultations and yesterday also party consultations on the roadmap forward. Again, in both uh, sets of consultation, quite a lot of participation, which we are very excited about. Um, but if anybody else would still like to join or, or make any other submission, uh, please do so. We would be most welcome to, to, we would be most happy to have your input. The third topic I would like to draw your attention to is that we we also have our financial mechanism second review upcoming. Monica mentioned the centrality of this me mechanism to the work of our convention and um, submissions had been invited as per the terms of reference by September. We've noted that actually very few parties have made submissions and uh, we would just like to um, say that even though the official um, date of submission was September, we would earnestly like to encourage parties and others uh, to make submissions uh, on the financial mechanism so that the reviewer, the independent reviewer, has as much information as ha at hand for this very, very important task, periodic task, in fact, as mandated and requested by the convention text. Let me take you to the next topic, and that is national reporting, and we always are quite um, happy to see the high level of national reporting by our parties. Uh, we have a 92% reporting rate. We are awaiting 10 reports um, and are, are reaching out in all ways to, to those uh, remaining 10, but uh, we hope to have them in soon. The preliminary report has already gone to the Implementation and Compliance Committee, um, and they have also been very enthused by the high reporting rate. Um, and so we hope to have the remaining reports in in time uh, for the next meeting of the Implementation and Compliance Committee that will be meeting in person um, here in Geneva in, in, May, in March uh, of next year. But just to also draw your attention to a piece of work that was also requested um, by COP4, which is um, the uh, uh, any additional comments parties may have on the draft guidance that was prepared by the Secretariat uh, on reporting. Uh, in particular, any additional comments parties may have in light of their own learning on completing the full reports. And we have such a high reporting rate that I'm sure all parties may have an opinion on how useful or not the guidance were and if there was anything that we could do to make them even uh, more helpful or, or add to it, please let us know. We've had a dedicated Minamata online session on this and there's a dedicated form for comment and you can make comments as you go or by the deadline. Um, we have been receiving some already and are very grateful for that. But just to draw your attention to that, including all of the documentation in that regard. Um, and then um, we've had the Minamata Convention specific international program board meeting uh, has just convened. We have a, um, a quite a, a, a new board. We've had four uh, recurring members and we have a whole host of new um, persons on the board, but many experienced persons from other similar boards and other conventions. So it's very, uh, very good experience coming into this board. And as uh, co-chairs elected are uh, Gina Griffith from Suriname and uh, Andrew Clark from the United States. So two very experienced and, and very trusted uh, person um, negotiators across the conventions, but for certainly also for Minamata. And we're very happy to see that. The board discussed the implementation uh, status of the 24 projects under implementation. In fact, four are already closed, so it was also to, to look at that. Um, but it also is looking at the um, midterm evaluation of the SIP and also the second um, financial mechanism deadline. So with that, we hope to be able to launch the fourth round as soon as possible. And so the board um, is not yet in a position to launch that round, um, but hopes based on the on envelope to the specific trust fund to do so shortly. 
There are more slides, which I will not go into much detail of, but for those that work on releases, um, this is a status of that. A couple of meetings have happened uh, on that, in fact, um, and uh, the draft of the work on the BATBAP of releases will be uh, released shortly for comment. We also have ongoing work on thresholds. Again, the details are here on the slide, and there will be a face-to-face -face meeting on this, uh, which is actually um, just after the, the meeting with our colleagues at the Basel, uh, for the Basel Convention, and on purpose because of so many officials in, in overlap in this. So we're very happy for that collaboration. Um, let me just give you a small status update on our general and specific and special trust funds. We have, uh, I'd like to say 70%, but our, our admin officer would like to say 69.83% uh, in of uh, our contributions, and we are extremely happy to have this. Uh, contributions are due by the end of the year, so we still have a couple of weeks. If any of our parties do not uh, have their uh, contributions in yet and are in need of their uh, letter, maybe it's gotten lost, uh, please just let us know and we shall be happy to do so. And the last slide important we have our amendment uh a notice out our of course our annex a was amended in terms of the product categories of mercury added products uh, please see the detail here and uh, our amendment would come into force in on the 28th of september next year just uh, uh just shortly shortly before we actually meet with all of you here in geneva um for our cop5 with that thank you very much um and handing back Thank you very much, Claudia. And when we say 92%, we can say 100, right? If we approximate. So congratulations for, for that big, big achievement. Now I'm passing the floor to, to Sandra. Thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, hello, colleagues in, um, in the room and online. Uh, I'm Sandra Averus. I'm uh, acting as Knowledge and Risk Unit uh, Head for the Chemicals and Health uh, branch in the chemicals and health branch and i would like just to provide today a brief overview of um, the work that we are doing in support of these negotiations and uh, in support of the events that will be uh, upcoming uh, in in 2023 and in particular we we've had a number of briefings where we highlighted you know the science and the knowledge that the branch is providing and um and sometimes spearheading some of of the uh, of the processes, and and I'll just mention the GCO two, the Global Chemicals Outlook two, or the the issues report um, that have been developed uh, as a follow up to request from from uh, UNEA resolutions. And today I would like to highlight some work related to supporting implementation and how we gather partners uh, around uh, these important topics related to chemicals and waste. And maybe um, one of the um, most relevant uh, work to highlight when we look into implementation and into partnership is, is the Global Mercury Partnership that was created uh, in, 2020, in, in 2005 sorry, uh, by UNEP Governing Council and uh, that has supported in its early stages the, the development and, and finally the the birth of the convention and is now supporting its implementation um, together with uh, providing some knowledge and science on mercury as well as uh, delivering outreach and awareness raising so the the partnership is is uh, just had its 13th partnership advisory group meeting in november 2022 where we could look into um, the exchanges on on recent activities priorities um, the uh, spread out to a wide network uh, with some webinars that are in small highlighted below uh, and the uh, recent uh, knowledge and, and science uh, that is coming out on uh, mercury in oil and gas and mercury in non-ferrous metal mining and smelting. Um, this is just really to highlight how a multi-stakeholder bringing like all the different stakeholders uh, around the table, multi-stakeholder partnership can continue support and help the implementation of these important agendas. 
Um, another um, highlight I wanted to put forward, and um, in the next slide you'll see a summary of it, uh, but is, is the, the Minamata National Action Plans. And as they get submitted to uh, the Secretariat of the Minamata Convention, I think 22 have been submitted at the moment. Um, we are, with the support of the GEF and, and, uh, and the partnership, we are, as UNEP, extracting this information and putting it in a, in a database that you, you can find here in the slide and you will find in the uh, GEN website later on. So it's providing the key baseline figures. It's providing the, the occurrence of worst practices uh, in, in the countries that have submitted their NAP. Uh, it's providing qualitative baseline information, and we hope it will be a useful tool. And it is a useful tool for parties uh, when looking at the, the trends and uh, uh, on, on uh, ASGM in that case. Another dashboard um, that I wanted to highlight uh, supporting implementation of MEAs is related to um, the, the UNEP uh, GEF project on, on POPs uh, monitoring global monitoring plans and uh, is really putting forward uh, all the data, information, lessons learned that we could put forward uh, on POPs monitoring in, um, if I recall, more with more than 60 labs, 200 labs. I can't remember the number. <laughs> Jacqueline will, will tell us. <laughs> and, uh, and this is really an interesting aspect because it also helps supporting the, the policy development and addressing the, the POPs in countries. And that's what the case study in Vanuatu is uh, showcasing here, how the monitoring of POPs supports the uh, action and implementation. I'll go briefly over the DDT dashboard and just say we have put all these um, dashboard and information on the World Environment Situation Room. So the link that is on the right hand side of the slide, bottom right, is driving you to these dashboards. So hopefully you can play with them. And, and this can also inform um, the uh, further developments and discussions of uh, the next year and forward. Another element, uh, not related to MEAs, but to the Beyond 2020 process, and my colleague Rafal has a, um, uh, referred to it, uh, IOMC, so um, the nine uh, organizations at the moment working on chemicals management, uh, have been putting forward this uh, paper inf document on strengthening integrated chemicals and waste management and at IIP 4.1 in Bucharest. And as a follow-up, um, a workshop is being organized in Paris on 18 and 19 January um, to address uh, global chemicals and waste management in chemical intensive economic sectors and value chain. So we very much hope to have a multi-stakeholder workshop again, uh, building on, on the knowledge and experience of um, the, the different stakeholders and, of course, uh, those that are very active in these economic sectors and value chains, and to um, discuss how um, there could be uh, either uh, guiding principles, roadmaps, uh, or specific engagement uh, from the sector to, to support a sound management of chemicals and waste in the context of the Beyond 2020. So this meeting is organized by IOMC um, and is hosted at the OECD in Paris in January 2023. And maybe two uh, last elements related to, to the implementation of, of resolution. Um, in, at UNEA this year, uh, the resolution 5-7 has welcomed the Green and Sustainable Chemistry Framework Manual. Uh, and its executive summary and has encouraged their use as appropriate. So UNEP is um, dedicating uh, the year of 2022-2023 to its uptake and, and implementation. And this includes, uh, we are at the early stage, but development with UNITAR uh, of an e-learning course. 
Um, it also includes work on specific sectors, such as a workshop that is going to take place on the 20th of January in Paris on green and sustainable chemistry and the building sector. Uh, so this is just an illustration again of more than 80 or, or 100 experts that have come together uh, to uh, highlight the, the principal uh, objectives that you, you see on, on the screen of green and sustainable chemistry. And maybe one last word, uh, which is related to antimicrobial resistance, uh, UNEP together with, uh, has joined early this year, um, what was called the tripartite, now the quadripartite. So in collaboration with FAO, with WHO and um, WOAH, the Animal Health Organization, uh, have been advancing uh, the work on antimicrobial resistance and in particular from our standpoint, the environmental dimension. Um, and that included through the participation on, of the third ministerial conference on antimicrobial resistance that took place in uh, Muscat Amman with the uh, Muscat Declaration. Um, but some other uh, highlights are, are included in this slide. And, and for the sake of time, I, I won't go through all of them, but uh, wanted also to highlight the AMR Global Leaders Group meeting and um, the current open um, call for uh, application uh, to, to become part of this global leaders group meeting. So you can check up the uh, website that is in the slide and um, looking for, for application by end of December. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. These were a few illustrative uh, elements of the work uh, that we're conducting to help support the implementation of this very busy international agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. And when I hear all of you, it's always very encouraging to see the different topics that we are dealing with. And sometimes it's under the heading of chemicals and waste. And sometimes it becomes uh, other topics of agenda like the antimicrobial resistance. But uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. And now I'm turning again to my right uh, to a, a person that is a big supporter of the chemicals and waste agenda. and from a country that also has been supporting the, not only the Geneva environment community, but also the international negotiations very much. So, Michel, uh, please, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Do you want to take some questions first, perhaps? Ah, okay. <laughs> That's a good reminder. <laughs> to you. Okay, so I just lost my presentation about you. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, uh, I think uh, we will go first to questions and answers. And from what I have seen, there are no uh, so far. But I would like to, to maybe highlight that we have over 120 people online, uh, plus others uh, in social media, uh, the crowd here as well. Um, any questions at this moment? in this room to any of the, the presenters. So everything was very clear. <laughs> yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, Vanessa Liaga from the Permanent Mission of Peru. Um, first and foremost, thanking everyone for all the information provided. This has been really um, educational, particularly for me as a new delegate um, that I'll be covering or uh, assisting in the coverage of of the chemicals portfolio. So thank you so much for, for all the information that has been shared. I have two questions that might um, uh, perhaps be a little uh, too ignorant, but I'll just gonna go ahead and, and ask them. Um, one was the um, process for the SICAM. There were references to negotiations going on for a text, but it wasn't clear to me what that text was. I'm sorry if I if I missed that. And then the other question, very concretely, was um, the national focal points. Uh, they said that uh, we were lacking 
um, some designations for the Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, are we supposed to have one per country? Because um, I saw 15 were, were already assigned, so I was wondering how many were missing. Um, and yes, if it's all of Latin America and, and the Caribbean, I guess, is my, my question. Um, that's all I can think of for right now, but I'll probably have more questions in, in a little bit. Thank you. Yes, and maybe. Yes, before turning to Rafael, I would like to, to thank uh, and congratulate your ambassador for being the president of the INC in, in plastics, Ambassador Gustavo, and I don't remember his last. Yes, okay, thank you. Rafael, please. Yes, thank you so much. I will answer the first question. So yeah, we are now in the process of negotiating a document that in the future will create a framework for the post SICAM. So uh, if you if you go to the, our web page, there is a report from the from the meeting in Bucharest and annexed to it is uh, it includes a consolidated text that was prepared by the by the co-chairs of the process and that compiled the work done by the, the various thematic groups in Bucharest. So I'm I'm happy to share with you and share with the link and and, and send it to you if, if needed. So this is kind of like a document still in progress because it, this is we'll continue working on that document in in Nairobi. I'm not sure if I am the one to answer the question on the on the focal points. No, that was SPP. Sorry. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the focal point nomination process has been a little bit of a a long drawn out process i'm afraid we are working through our new newly appointed bureau members to facilitate that process and our regional office uh, offices around the world to encourage member states to come forward with their nominations um i think to be perfectly frank it's a little bit of um competing priorities with the plastics inc running these two big processes at the same time is you know, we, we we tend to get a little bit forgotten about. So um, if you would like access to that list, it is on the website and it is updated regularly. And uh, if you pass your details, I can um, put you in touch with the person who manages that. Thank you. Yes, I don't see any other questions. Right, Diana, we don't have any others. Okay, so now, yes, uh, I'll the floor to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline, for giving me the floor. My name is Michel Chiren. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for this uh, GEN briefing. Uh, on behalf of the Swiss Federal Office for the Environment, many thanks to the Geneva Environment Network uh, Diana and the whole team for organizing this event and um, to all the speakers today for their presence and for sharing their views and, and the wealth of information uh, about the ongoing um, and upcoming negotiations. <clears throat> Many um, decisions have been taken this year that were uh, big steps, um, thinking in particular about UNEA with the science policy decision and the plastics decision. And I also think about the BRS COPs with the Basel e-waste amendment. And before that, also the adoption of the Rotterdam compliance mechanism. Um, there's also the amendments adopted at the um, last Minamata COPs. So with all of this um, in the chemicals and waste field, we can say that actors show the willingness to act on important and pressing issues. And it gives me confidence that this positive commitment will continue also in the future. 2023 will be a chemicals and waste year with many such opportunities to take other um, necessary ambitious steps for the chemicals and waste management at the global level and of course the implementation on the ground. I would like to highlight the Rotterdam Convention Amendment proposal that was submitted earlier this year by Switzerland, Australia and Mali and which is now also co-sponsored by the governments of Ghana and Burkina Faso. Um, David, you have already introduced um, this proposal and 
um, you know, uh, deferred to me, but I think you, you did a good job by mentioning uh, the content of the proposal. I can say a couple of words about the rationale uh, for having put forward such a proposal. So in the past, and in particular at the past Rotterdam conference of the parties, there was um, a general frustration because of the cases where the conference of the parties has failed to list chemicals in Annex 3, despite the fact that these chemicals uh, fulfill the criteria to be listed. And such chemicals uh, include, for example, chrysotile asbestos. They could not be listed in the convention for many years now, uh, although the great majority of parties uh, are in favor and have been in favor of following the recommendation by the CRC um, to list them in Annex 3, and only a handful of parties opposed uh, the listing. This undermines the objective of the convention, and this is why uh, Switzerland, together with Australia and Mali, and Ghana and Burkina Faso, we are proposing to the parties at the next COP to amend the convention uh, that will uh, take place, as mentioned by David, in May next year. The proposal foresees a new annex. Uh, this annex will be additional to the existing Annex 3 and chemicals for which the COP is not able to list in Annex 3 will be listed in this new annex. And the decision to list in the new annex can be taken by a, a majority vote, three quarters majority vote, as a last resort if all efforts to reach consensus are exhausted. The new annex has the same rights and obligations for the parties as the existing Annex 3. For, for, for instance, the um, prior informed consent procedure, the PIC, would apply um, the same way as uh, for the existing annex. The only modification is that an explicit consent is required, making the new annex a bit more stringent than the existing annex three. We think the adoption of that proposal will significantly strengthen the convention and will be an important step towards the sound management of chemicals. The proponents certainly welcome uh, the support to this proposal and uh, governments that would like to become a co-sponsor uh, can of course contact me uh, for Switzerland or uh, colleagues, the colleagues from Australia and uh, Mali and Ghana and Burkina Faso in, in order to do so. And we are of course happy also to, to take questions and um, uh, engage in, in, in discussions around the proposal. With regard to the science policy panel, the upcoming meeting, the OWG 1.2, will be important to include from the start different disciplines, so not just the environment side, but also other sectors, and in particular the health uh, side, and therefore also the WHO. Uh, Kevin, you have also um, mentioned the discussion around the scope. Um, it seems uh, wise to me to adopt an approach where uh, there would be a broad scope and um, there would no, not be a restriction from the start, but rather there, we would, through that process of the OWG, install good procedures for priority setting and also for agreeing the program of work and the budget uh, of the new science policy panel. This way, the plenary of the SPP can decide on the assessments, uh, which ones should be carried out, which ones should be prioritized, and will not be restricted over time uh, in the scope when potential new issues might arise um, some years down from now. In order to ensure a good link from the latest scientific knowledge to the policymakers, which is really the, the goal of the, the, the panel, academia should have a, a crucial role uh, in the science policy panel. And ac academia should therefore also be very present and involved 
in the science policy OEWG process from the start. I would like to express um, my thanks to the government of Thailand for hosting the, the meeting in January in Bangkok and of course also UNEP for um, the preparatory work towards that meeting. I would also encourage um, all colleagues and everyone present also online in this meeting to consider um, registration for this meeting. As we've heard, deadlines are, are coming up and the meeting is not so far away. It is also my pleasure, of course, here to confirm the information provided by you, Kevin, earlier that um, the Swiss government has extended an invitation to host the science policy um, open-ended work working group meeting um, in 2024, so OEWG 3. So these are a few points that I wanted to highlight from the discussion, from the very rich discussion here today. I think I that's just, uh, you know, picking out a, a few. The, the, the information today was very rich, and I think that is precisely the, the aim of the chemicals and waste uh, briefings uh, it is the GEN who does provide, in a concise way, this uh, platform on this wealth of information about the ongoing negotiations. And I think it's very useful, uh, certainly for many governments and other stakeholders. Uh, therefore, I want to thank again uh, Diana and the whole GEN team uh, for, for having organized the meeting and in particular also uh, all of the many speakers that took the time here to, to brief us about what has happened this year and what is coming up uh, in terms of opportunities to engage. So thank you very much and um, back to you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, always learning in these briefings, a lot of in and sharing of a lot of information. I'd like to uh, extend a particular thank to the Gen and to Diana for organizing this last briefing of, of the year on chemicals and waste. So thank you very much, Diana and your team. Uh, now uh, we are closing the event uh, today, but as you might have a smell or seen before entering, there is coffee outside. <laughs> so we still have around 15 minutes before lunchtime. It would be great if you can stay and maybe share some views and, and discuss some points as well. So uh, please feel free. Thank you very much to all. And I have a squeak.